I'd like to extend to all of you a cordial and perhaps even warm greeting to this space tonight. The greeting may be warm even if the building isn't. <laughs> I assure you, you have come to the right place on this evening. This is a very special place. I'm honored that this congregation tolerates me as its senior pastor. But further, I'm further honored every day when I walk into this church, I'm walking literally into American history. This is the oldest black institution in New York State with origins dating back to 1774, formally organized in 1796. We were legally incorporated as a legal institution in 1801, 26 years before the abolition of slavery in this state. This is a very special place. Mother Amy Zion Church helped to give birth to the country of Liberia. Mother Amy Zion Church, a spot, the Grand Depot in New York City of the Underground Railroad. Mother Amy Zion Church, an institution that fought publicly and secretly to eradicate slavery in New York State until they were successful on July 4th, 1827. It was at the altar of Mother Zion downtown that a woman named Isabella Bonfrey changed her name from Isabella Bonfrey to Sojourner Truth. Frederick Douglass was married in Mother Zion Church September of 1839. When it was time to build this building, which was completed in 1925, seed money had begun to be planted before the building was completed. This building that we are in is largely in part to a bequest left to us in the estate of one of our more prominent members by the name of Madam C.J. Walker. There are neighboring churches that perhaps may have larger memberships, but most certainly not larger impact. New York's first black police officer, Samuel Ballard, member of this church for 66 years. America's first black person to teach white people first black professor in America, Charles Reason, member of this church, first president of the Institute for Colored Youth, which later became Cheney University down in Pennsylvania, was a member here. And another gentleman who we will be honoring here, along with the New York Philharmonic on April 2nd, was a member of this church from 1936 until his death in 1976, a man by the name of Paul Rhodes. His funeral was right here in this space. When we were not allowed in Carnegie Hall, Mother Amy Zion Church was Carnegie Hall for black people in New York City. It was built to be just that. The acoustics that you now experience, 75 foot ceilings. Before the church began to take on a more liturgical look before we installed the stained glass windows, before the exposed orbit pipes, before white Jesus showed up on the scene in 1949, this room was literally intended to be a multi-purpose auditorium space for religious purposes, but most importantly, a room where we could be ourselves in all spheres of excellence with our dignity still intact. So when the opportunity came through Gary Padmore who opened the door for us to become community partners with the New York Philharmonic, I said absolutely, because it is absolutely within the DNA of this congregation to sponsor programming of this nature. We've been doing it for well over two centuries now. 
So we welcome you to this space. We hope that you take time to look at the information regarding upcoming liberation and spirit events sponsored by the New York Philharmonic. And in the event you have nothing to do on a Sunday morning, you are in need of quality preaching and good inspiration, at least with a remotely handsome minister, come here to Mother's Iron Church. Give yourselves a hand for coming out tonight. Give yourselves a hand. We are real to have you. And I can say, Gary Catmore, this evening. Give him a hand as he comes. As far as the programming that we do at the Philharmonic, one in particular is a program we call The Unanswered Questions, which for us is an opportunity to think about how the, art, the artistic um, programming at the Philharmonic reflects our humanity and our society. And so this week, as we alluded to, we're presenting works surrounding the idea of liberation and thinking about what liberation means for us as black people, but also as collectively, and, and, and so how, how that is taking shape in music. And so it is my honor, you know, I was talking before we get to the panel, I was talking to the panelists last night, and um, it was mentioned by one of the panelists, you know, collectively this group, um, you know, has 60 years worth of research and, and, and artistry and, and all the amazing things. And what was said was, you know, I'm not sure if you know this, Mary, but we're kind of a big deal. Um, and they are. And so, you know, you all will be delighted to be able to hear from these wonderful people. And, um, and I, I did paraphrase, I not paraphrase what you said, but we're in church. So, um, <laughs> Uh, I will pass it over to um, my wonderful colleague and friend, Dr. Cordero Hadley. I know this conversation is going to go lots of different unanticipated ways, and that's what excites me most about it. But I, I wanted to start here. I was struck by something Reverend Bird just said to us about this space. It was intended to be a place where Black people could come and gather and be themselves and have their dignity intact. Um, I was curious if either of you, both of you, could share about being in this particular space, having this particular conversation. Well, first of all, it's, it's also exciting um, being here. I used to live a block over um, for, for a couple of years, but I was also already playing for a church in Newark called Bethany Baptist Church. So even though I was surrounded by these wonderful historic churches in home, um, but I also was playing at a historic church in Newark. So but it's really great to be in my um, my former neighborhood. Um, but yeah, just the history, I mean, hearing that history just blows me away, kind of, I mean, I already know, like we say, the year and like the place, like what that means, but then when you list, you know, Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass and, and the Paul Rose and the generations of history. Um, yeah, I mean it's 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 amazing. It's it's a unique space, and then also I I have always appreciated throughout my life having um, having spaces similar. I mean every space is different, but just having um, space where like where a sacred space for Black people to gather and be their full selves, like no matter what their job is, their place in society, and society sees it, like everybody respects one another and you know just have a place where people affirm one another's personhood and that's just so important to have um you know growing up what's um particularly um moving for me is uh, that i've been doing research on pennsylvania you know black people and uh, freedom came a little earlier there i think in 17 82 or, or, or so. So uh, to just think about sitting here, and I heard the dates from Pastor, and I'm thinking, well, we really had a, like a rollout. It was like a rollout freedom. <laughs> it just like Waves of freedom. It just, it just rolled out state by state. And, uh, and the uh, New Jersey was the, <laughs> the last state <laughs> to let go of uh, slavery in this area. So it, it's just fascinating to me to hear the uh, the local histories of freedom against the larger narrative that we always talk about being you know, leading to the Emancipation Proclamation, but it was actually a piecemeal, you know, uh, a project, this, this idea of black freedom. And I'm 
also struck that when you have churches that are this old, they were performing so many functions for communities. It wasn't just worship. It's where you could get a good meal. It's where you could uh, be educated. Often people learn to read in churches, in literacy programs and and that. So this kind of multi-purpose uh, space is always fascinating. And then as musicians, we are always keenly interested in, you know, okay, so what does that all mean for what music was played and heard? Well, what does it? <laughs> How do you, both of you deal with sacred music among many other genres and what you do? Um, Courtney, I was thinking a lot about your Alpha Bless. And because you use so much of your family's church in New Orleans and the visual imagery of that piece, um, as well as I was thinking about your piece, Sanctum, where you use the sermons of Shirley Caesar and C.O. Franklin in commentary on police brutality, right? Um, and for you, I'm thinking about spiritual vibe too, how you keep going back to this really rich and valuable repertoire of music that is the Negro spirituals, right? And you can, your arrangements of them, your interpretation of them, help us to hear them both in their sort of antiquity and in the contemporary moment. So, and I know both of you, and you talked about you played the Bethany, and I, I've read your books, and I know, I know you personally, I know you came up playing in church as well, so could you share with us a little bit about um, playing in churches, the music of churches, and how that informs your artistry and scholarship. Sure. Yeah, thanks for thanks for I always love your questions. <laughs> <laughs> These are my friends, but I'm also their fans. And so I'm straight up nerd out of it. Those I'm taking notes of my poetry. Um but yeah, growing up my church that I grew up in is called St. Luke's Episcopal Church in New Orleans. Um, it's an Anglican church, uh, mostly Caribbean um um, congregation as well as people from Central and South America and West Africa and from the U.S. But that blend of, that was like our Caribbean community for the most part in New Orleans, like, well, that was one of the central hubs of my church. Um, and I grew up in that, and musically it's definitely influenced me because I was, it's natural for me to hear like the Anglican hymns and Gregorian chant along with, with the spiritualists. And with sometimes with West African drumming and sometimes with like tambourine doing different like rhythms in the Caribbean. So I'm kind of used to that mix and I think that that influences a lot of the way I think about music. Um, but yeah, even just kind of the wider thing, like you're talking about how I have a piece that might be political, but it's also sacred in a lot of the, the message in those sermons. I mean, something like Sanctum happens. Sermons can kind of sneak into you to it's, it's like a powerful sermon. <laughs> I was listening to Pastor Shirley Caesar, Reverend C.L. Franklin, really musically. I was listening to sermons to like understand about like the improvisation and the preaching style mm -hmm. of holiness preaching. And I was really appreciating it, but the words were speaking to me on a deeper level. And as I was dealing with um, my own difficult uh, emotions to to the issue of police brutality and the lack of justice in many of those cases, then it started to realize that the both of those sermons were like. Speaking to that, so it was, it was great to be able to make a piece um, that was drawn from sermons that was speaking to police brutality and for orchestra and recorded sound. Um, and usually, I mean, I, I just always have in the churches I've been a part of, especially like when I was at Bethany Baptist Church, there wasn't a I, um, the pastor at the time was um, Dr. Reverend M. William Howard. Political and and religion or and spiritual were always together. It wasn't mm -hmm. like, you know, the whole idea of like liberation. Black religion. Yeah, black religion yeah, theology. I've always been drawn to that because it's about, you know, what we can do while we're here. And um, and and then while, while we're here, so focusing on the now, the spiritual, but also being aware of like the spiritual nature of stuff, like of being aware that maybe certain truth and, and Frederick Douglass are like sitting with us, you know. <laughs> so there's that too. Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, that's the kind of response. Thank you. I, I love how we are all church connected, but you grew up in the church in Florida. You in New Orleans and you on the south side of Chicago. So this is a wonderful to be here in New York talking about all this. <laughs> you know, this is a big ass one. Um, 
Yeah, my, my earliest musical memories, as I point out in my new book, Who Hears Here, is of walking in the Mount Moriah Baptist Church and feeling the fire four or five years old. And I recognized the musician as being the kind of center of all of that. The, the musician was the furnace. And I was fixated. And I think I got hooked at that moment, you know, that uh, I understood the power of music. Uh, grew up in a, and then I actually grew up in a, a CME church. <laughs> and I guess, yeah, and then, uh, as I, uh, when I became an adult, I used all of that very experience to be a gigging church musician. So I would play at the United Methodist Church at 8 a.m. Then I had my main gig, which was, uh, Second Baptist Church, you know, drove, you know, 15 miles up the road to Evanston, Illinois. And then the church I belonged to was the St. James Church of God of Christ. I was going to say, I know that was the last one. That was the last one. Go be the hell thing. Exactly. Because, you you know, I had time to do all of that <laughs> and still get to church on time because you walk in, they still in testimony service. <laughs> Wait for the preacher to come in. Uh-huh. And one of those things I learned, just dropped in, in my, my spirit here, is that the repertoire was the same, but the treatment was different. So at 8 o'clock, I would play What a Friend We Had in Jesus like this. Expectations, and if I put a, do- a, wrong, a dominant seven in that early morning service, I actually did get fired. <laughs> they don't want to. They didn't want it too bluesy, you know. Mm-hmm. They wanted it just so. So it, it wasn't ecumenical like your New Orleans experience, of course, because we know what y'all about down there. Mm-hmm. You know, you just recognize that everybody's there. Mm-hmm. I love that because just in our own experiences in black churches and what you just demonstrated at the piano, we tend to talk about the black church in the singular, um, but what you just demonstrated is the diversity that exists in the churches, and which we can easily point to, as you say, the musical tra- treatment of this central repertoire. Like when you start playing, I was like, oh, that's us, we got this. We right in the middle, give us a little bit, not too much, right? Right. Um, right. So I, I, I'd love to hear you all speak more about getting on to the theme of this, this idea of freedom. I see it in your work, and I see it as a through line between what each of you do as both composers and scholars and musicians, but I'm, I'm curious how you interpret the word freedom, the activities that you, out of the many things each of you do, in which you feel the most free, Right? Um, I think a lot about what Nina Simone says, freedom means her, it means no fear. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's certainly one interpretation of, of the notion of freedom, but I'm very interested to hear from each of you about that. Mm-hmm. Well, directly related to the Nina Simone quote, I remember in that interview she was doing where she says freedom, what if freedom means to her, it means no fear. But there was also, before she got to that, it's like she was working through the question, and I remember her saying, um, and I'm going to misquote, but I remember her saying about, there's been a few times on stage where I really felt free. And she's like, and that's something else. And just like in her expression. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mind very yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I just like, I've been thinking about that moments idea, and that kind of ties to me talking about the rolling out of freedom. Mm-hmm. And and I'm also going to, um, it's 
someone has the correct quote correctly, but Colonel Scott King said about how freedom, you know, freedom is something that must be fought for every generation. And so I was like, okay, freedom is this thing that you're always like grasping for, or I'm always feeling like I'm grasping for, or people are, but it's like a, it's not like a thing that you grab and you hold. It's, it's like something that we continue to to fight for as far as like as people and like um, in our in our society. But then there's like inner freedom and kind of like what is um so yeah, I like that idea of the moments because I would say my most free times have been on stage with the piano. Mm -hmm. Um I've felt it a few times through writing music, like the process, but um but especially the times I could really stand out like where I feel like okay, I caught the spirit in this moment and I went somewhere else, you know, like that's been at the piano and it could be in a church or a nightclub. It doesn't matter like the you know, the environment. Because one place where that happened was at St. Nick's Pub when I used to exist. You remember the St. Nick's Pub? Yes. But, um, you remember St. Nick's Pub? Yes. <laughs> yeah, but I remember um, I remember it happening there and I was like, oh, it can happen anywhere. Because normally it's something that would happen to me in a space that I consider like traditionally a sacred space. Um, but yeah, that moments thing is interesting to me because I, I realized one day when I look back at my work that I've always been like making music about freedom. Like my first album I did is called Quest for Freedom. And then I did one that was all based on spiritual. Mm -hmm. And like freedom just kind of always in there, but I hadn't like made like a goal, like that's what it is. Like, oh, I'm really thinking about freedom, but um, but I always feel like it's something I'm still reaching for. I don't feel like it's something like I've attained except at moments. Mm -hmm. mm. uh, like you, I think I try to go for that freedom everywhere. Anytime I sit down at the piano, no matter where I am, it's the goal. Um, I mean, that's how I came up. You, you, you always trying to move something up. Mm -hmm. Move something up in the people, move something up in yourself. I think the uh, freedom comes as a cleansing. Mm -hmm. I feel that when I'm in the face of great music is when I get my most profound thoughts. It's the only time it really happens for me. Seriously, you know, it's, something will occur to me. Some uh, transformation or revelation or something occurs to me when I'm in sound, and uh, it's addictive to me. And it is the goal that I I, I go for. Uh, and I'm just getting to where I can find that in the recording studio because it often happens live because you're kind of uninhibited because you know even if you make a mistake you won't have to live with it for the rest of your life <laughs> you know it's if it's if it's, you have recorded it right but uh and it's getting more and more now where that kind of hookup to freedom is starting to occur to me in the recording studio because i think it's i'm recognizing that uh, the risk of letting go is worth it if you get there. And even if the notes aren't everything you had planned, it's still worth it. And then the reaction you get out of people when you get to hook up in yourself, you know, you get the affirmation right away from the people, whether you're in the club or whether you're in the in the service. Mm -hmm. My brain is like firing in such a different direction. Um, I'm thinking about the quote that says, when you were talking about like spirit and music, right, and how those two things are related, it made me think of that quote that Proverbs, the spirit won't be sent without a song, right? This idea that music is the portal that can usher us in to a space of liberation, even if it is a moment. Uh, and I think about the wisdom and the depth of things like black liberation theology that, you know, they weren't using that term during slavery, but it's encoded in the lyrics of the spirituals, right? Um, and both of you have worked extensively with spirituals and how and why they still speak to us. I talked to Mike in this idea of consistently having to fight for freedom, each generation having to wage some type of war for freedom. Um, and one of the things that's so powerful about being here is it reminds us that freedom is not something that was benevolently, benevolently bestowed or given. It was fought for and paid for 
and blood many times over, right? Um, and so this idea that all of these things are connected in music is, is sort of our historical record of that, but also our way into finding contemporary freedom in this moment. And like, I talked to my parents who are in their 70s and 80s, and they're, they're like, I didn't think your generation would have to fight these same battles. And so as musicians and as composers, I'm really interested to know how, what you all think are the opportunities for music to give us that kind of freedom. Do you, you know, in what ways um, does that become a burden for the music? Or is that a necessity of the music to sort of create moments of reprieve um, for, for the musicians as well as those who are engaged in the music? Well, I, I'm hesitant to always assign a, uh, a utility to an art form because sometimes a composer or musician might have one plan in mind with the, <laughs> you know, with their music, right? And uh, it might go totally left. Like you, you write a real restorative a song that you think is real restorative. Somebody in the congregation might say, "Yep, I'm divorcing that dude." This is it. <laughs> <laughs> that was the that was their revelation that they got out of what you just did. That you know what that chord is. Who can who can pin it down? You know, you know it's, it's so it's a uh, that's the the. Uh, the, uh, uh, the the beautiful part of this this art form that we deal in, because it's so non-representational, particularly in instrumental music, you it's able to absorb whatever connotation you want to ascribe to. It. So it can be, you know, you can say it's one thing, and then somebody else will say it means something else. Somebody else might think that, wow, this is totally free. I love when people just play atonal music and there's no rhythm to it. I just, it just really gets me there. Another person say, this is the most off-putting, non-compelling music that I've ever heard. So it, the sound is the same, but the meanings that people ascribe to it can be so radically different. Even in the same space, listening to the same music in the same time. So that's the, the, the fun part about it. That's what keeps us researching and, and trying to figure out why are those people listening to that music at this time in that place. Are you open the introduction of who hears here? Yes, that was a that was a book promo. <laughs> yeah, and, and along with the, the variety, like I am also impressed when I hear a song today and I'm like, oh that's a spiritual like today meaning a number of years ago, but like Ten Pick Mars, we gotta be alright. Mm -hmm. When that song came out, I was like, oh, this is a spiritual. And like, and it acted as that. Like, the way people, as a spiritual and as a, as a protest song, the way people use that in communities while they were protesting. And around the same time, like, I remember Jan uh, Janelle Monet had a, um, another piece that was like addressing police brutality. And it had like the, it had the music stylistic thing that you think of when you think of a protest, like, whatever those musical elements that you, Identify with a protest, so I've kind of put protests and spiritual together, but like, which I guess for a good Maybe reason, well. yeah, mm -hmm. for a good reason. But um, we, there are some songs that come out every now and then. I know Flying Lotus had some. It was not one with Kendrick Lamar, but just like never you that one. Yeah. That was a spiritual. So yeah. I'm like, I hear these pieces, and I'm like, oh, it's a spiritual. Just like I hear some music, I'm like, oh, that's the blues, like Cardi B. I'm like, oh, that's a blues artist. Mary J. Blige is a blues singer. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 song that she has out that that was nominated. Uh, good morning. Yeah. Good morning, gorgeous. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I love how y'all are finding these contemporary um, analogs and genres that we think of as historical, but they aren't really. They they are still living here among us. And um, Dr. Ramsey, I was thinking about when you were talking about music can have all these different meanings. I was thinking about this musical era you're in right now, where you're taking it back to Chicago. And house music, and which is, is you know so important because what African music and Black music often do is gather people. Mm -hmm. And so I was really, in, in, I'm thinking of Sam Floyd when I when I'm when I'm saying that. But I would I would love to hear you talk about sort of that delving into that 
repertoire music that's so much a part of your own biography and why this feels like the right time to make this such a significant part of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Halley is talking about a song I just dropped uh, called Who Hears. It's a house track with a rapper, chemist, um, and uh, it, it really just, I'm always seeking inspirations from what's going on around me. And of course, Drake and Beyonce dropped last summer. They, they did some house music and everybody, I saw all the young people so excited about it. I'm like, well, I was housing back when it first came out. <laughs> you know? So I, I, you know, I just, you know, tried my hand at it. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't believe I understand how genres work, mm -hmm. and I understand what they do in the world for people. I understand that to call something blues or R and B or soul or rap or urban contemporary is a way to for uh, the re the music industry to efficiently separate people from their money quickly because genres kind of identify us and we make strong identifications with them. That's my music and therefore you go right for that, you know, that sound when you're trying to do something in the world. But as a historian, as a musician, you know, I am uh, definitely sonically promiscuous. Uh, I am continually uh, sniffing around and trying to understand why those people are compelled by certain sound organizations. I'm, when I, when people told me at, at, during Ferguson protests that, you know, this moment happened and we were singing, we're going to be all right. The music historian in me wants to say, well, technically, yes, you couldn't have been singing because that involves pitches, and that song is actually a chance. Yes. <laughs> I, I just shut up. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, y'all saw it. Y'all saw that. <laughs> and just to fit in, you know, and, and understand that people. I, I look past. I look past what they were saying and, and and saw what they were feeling as they were doing it, and how it was functioning for them. And uh, and maybe that means singing now, mm -hmm. because a lot of the music that comes out is actually not a lot. Of it. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is very chanty. The, the pop music that's out now is very chants and beats, you know. Uh, <laughs> You know, so you know, Gladys Knight, you know, her her thing is is uh, that's not what is going to shoot to the top of the show, charts anymore. Mm -hmm. Anything you'd like to add? Um, oh, well, um, yeah, no, just the voice. When you're talking about the singing and chanting, I guess it's just that power and using your voice mm -hmm. and. I have to remember that because I used to not sing in, in situations because I thought you had to be a singer to sing. Mm. And I just like, well, I know my instruments, I play the piano. So I just didn't sing because I just thought you had to like do it a certain way. And then I realized what it does for me you know, mm -hmm. to sing along. And you can really kill yourself singing. Even if you don't know, like I was at, um, I spent some time at Alice, Alice Coltrane's Opera in California. And um, which now is not currently there, but. Um, but when, it, when I was there, and some of her, uh, some of the people at the opera were explaining the importance of the voice and how she would tell them it was important to, to sing. And they were singing music in Sanskrit that maybe uh, they didn't know the Sanskrit until they were singing it, and then they learned it as they went. But she was like, even if you're singing those bhaja, those those pieces in Sanskrit, you're you're communicating something, mm -hmm. and there's something that's being communicated back to you. So I'm like, okay, so that made me think deeper about it. So I just try to just kind of. I have stuff like um, therapeutically. I understand what exactly what you mean. Like I sing to myself all the time because of it's singing is vibration. The sound music is vibration. 
But there's something special about the voice because it's internal. And so that vibration is happening inside you, right? Um, and shifting something about yourself. And, you know, I think when you were talking about the purpose and what music, you know, people assigning function and, and ascribing meaning to it, I think a lot of times we uh, de-emphasize what it does for the music maker, what the person is, mm. who is creating it, what, what it does for them, first and foremost. And when you were talking about um, being at Alice Coltrane's ashram, because I'm sitting in the church, and I told y'all, I'm Baptist, and I'm a daughter and granddaughter of deacons who lined hymns. Oh, yeah. Right? And so when I was a kid, I hated it. It was slow. I didn't know what they were singing. I would just sit there and sing my vows next to my mama and just wait for the prayer and all that. But there is something healing. Oh, my God. Cathartic about singing a charge to keep I have. And it's just, you, you pitch it low and it's slow, practically unmetered. And everybody is just having this moment to orient them. You do this yeah. at the beginning of a church service yeah. to orient you to where you are. Yeah. Not in the parking lot, not in the road, way back to sister, your brother, your president. And this is what we're doing. And it's just acapella, voice, call and response. And takes up the time it needs to take up, you know. So I really appreciate you. It's a wave. I, I really, ooh, it's, it's kind of basic. I, I was going to say, don't push me too hard. I, I love the Lord, he heard my cry. I, I, Listen, listen, and then the moan, Lord help me. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. That it's, is healing. Oh my God, it's a wave that just comes through you. And I, I believe this church was built for that. Was built for that. And what's beautiful about walking in this building is that it is about oh, it is about acoustics, and it's obviously been able to adjust to the Hammond B three, to the Steinway, to amplification. You know that can be nothing but divine, mm -hmm. because how did that happen? That it each generation can walk into these. These, these, this room and get that same spirit. Mm -hmm. It's really a miracle. It's a miracle of our music, I believe. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the thing that makes it a tradition. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to let you all know, even if you wanted to share something else musically, you're welcome to do so. No pressure at all. But if the spirit <laughs> thus leads you, <laughs> I had to look at me in two directions. Also, <laughs> like, um, well, maybe, maybe I'll do um, "City Called Heaven." Mm. So, with the conversation of the spirituals, um, I've always been drawn to the spirituals. And one of my teachers growing up uh, was Moses Hogan, yes. uh, but actually for piano. So he was my piano teacher, and I remember working on Scott Joplin's music with him. So just think about that. And I didn't even know. Like, <laughs> I grew up, and I was like, oh, this is from Moses Hogan. <laughs> I mean, Moses Hogan. Yeah, Moses Hogan. I mean, I knew it was great, but just like, I got an idea of um, the, the, yeah. the impact of his work and, and, the, and the arrangements, the choral arrangements. So I've been obsessed with all the choral arrangements over the years, and Paul Johnson choral arrangements, and all, all the different, you know, all the great ones. But Moses Hogan, um, yeah, there's a spiritual that I was always drawn to, a city called Heaven. Um, and all the spirituals that, I know there's like a, often a double meaning in it, but sometimes like the idea of, you know, um, I, um, I am a poor pilgrim of sorrow. Yes, congregation. <laughs> Sometimes I'm talking. Sometimes I don't know where to call. Come on. Call him. Oh, yeah. I'm excited. Let him 
Thank you so much. Yes. So I'm going to play for you my arrangement of the city called Heaven. Um, that sometimes I play with a band, but I have my solo piano version. And um, thank you so much for that. Well.
sometimes I feel like on my other side. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Oh, dang yellow. Sometimes I feel like a mother. Sometimes I feel like I'm on the sky. Sometimes I feel like I'm on. sure that we get a chance to hear from you all as well. If you want to share a question or a thought, um, we are happy to, to hear from you. music before I had these piano pieces I wrote when I was a student at Oberlin and um, 
they were all based on different rhythms, and I had I called them piano etudes at the time, but I had these four different piano pieces I wrote when I was at Oberlin, and that was one of them. But it, it had a lot of more. It, um, it kind of went longer with different sort of rhythms, and the challenge was to do that between the two hands. Um, lots of aspirations, but the ones I remember were uh, Yogi Ligeti and also Jerry Allen. So I think like between I was listening to both of them around at that time. Mm -hmm. So a lot of influence went to that, but um, mm -hmm. I had that as a piano piece, and then later when I was doing a recording, my Quest for Freedom recording, I was like, oh, how does that sound with City Called like City Called Heaven? Seemed to fit that. And what I wanted with City Called Heaven, just based on the words, was that I've always heard it slow, and it can be very, you know, solemn. I mean, it's such a solemn piece about longing for heaven, I'm not talking about, you know, and just thinking about the history behind that, like. A reality so bad during the time of slavery that what you long for is too is, is heaven, but also the spiritual side of that 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 that's a place that we're all trying to go. So, um, but I've always heard it slow, and I just felt like agitation in those lyrics. And so, my goal is to kind of represent that agitation that I feel, or my own my own reaction to that idea of longing for heaven so much. Because, and and, and like, what would the conditions be? In this world, to to be able to have heaven on, I mean, to have joy on earth, that um, you know. So there was a lot that went into why I united that that spiritual with my piano pieces, but it really was like me reacting to the words. Okay. Why you quit? The moment that came to my mind, so I'm going to trust it, was um, last summer. I was in Senegal, West Africa. And it's one of the countries from which Black people were captured and stolen and brought to the New World. And so when you go there, you're supposed to go to Gory Island, right? Um, and the door of no return, where there's La Maison de Desclave, like the house of the slaves. You're supposed to do that ritual. You sail to the island, right? It's like a 30, 40 minute um, boat ride to get to the island. And I'm a person who Googles everything, but I did not Google Gory Island. I, I had been to slave dungeons before in Ghana. And so, in some ways, this is like an obligatory thing, like, I'm, I'm a cinema, I gotta do it because I'm black. Um, and I remember the ship sort of rounding something, and you get this vision of Gory Island. And it was stunningly beautiful. I wasn't prepared for that. It was lush and green in a place where Senegalese go on day trips. People live on the island. The house, it reminds me of New Orleans in the sense that houses are painted bright colors and beautiful and stunning. And I went to the island, I went to the slave dungeon, and I did not stay. I wasn't feeling heavy laden. I felt like I had to leave that place and return to the life that was so bountiful all around it. And for me personally, I don't know the right word to use. I won't say that the weight of that history um, evaporated, but it shifted and allowed me to carry it very differently. And I left that dungeon and went to this massive baobab tree. And it hit me that those trees are hundreds of years old. And that tree is stunningly beautiful. And I said, this tree witnessed all of that and it's still alive and growing and beautiful and all this. And I, I felt like that was us, right? And I was able to leave that place, not heavy burden and heavy laden, and go to the little seaside restaurant and have some of the best calamari I've ever had in my life and, and be free, right? Like to be whole. And maybe that's also what freedom is, to be whole, to be complete, to feel like, you know, I have, I've done what is required of me and I get to live. And that's, that's what 
this place was meant to remind me of on that particular day to live. And so it was very profound and liberating for me to, that wasn't the experience I expected to have on Gory Island, but that was the experience that I was supposed to have mm -hmm. on Gory Island. See, don't go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a recent one for me just, um, I think a little less, that was, that was deep though, like, I was just, <laughs> you know, no, I appreciate sharing that. That's, that's amazing. I'm, yeah, let me talk about your experience with this one. Um, for me, just as a musician, like, there's always anxiety about what people are going to think about the music or, like, you know, like, there's a, there's a part of when you're creating it and maybe thinking about it and there's, like, right at the moment and stuff. So I had a premiere recently. It's a piano concerto I wrote for myself to perform, and I performed it with the L.A. Phil, and I had been really looking forward to this and really scared about it. And I was writing this piece while teaching full time. I didn't have like the time I wanted to dedicate to it, but I was like, it was like, it's gonna happen, you know? So, so I felt like, I remember that, that morning, I had all those voices come back, like all the questionable things about, is this, you know, just all the things that you learn like in school and stuff. So, like kind of these voices in your head. And then I remember like a moment before I went on stage, I just thought about like the excitement of the moment. Like, I wrote a piece that I wanted to write. Mm -hmm. I wrote it for myself to play, also for others to play. And then I was playing with these amazing musicians, and then I was in great hands, and so I didn't have to worry about anything. Mm -hmm. And on the stage, and so I just remember that moment where I suddenly, I was like, kind of wrapped up in stuff, and I just got free, because I was like, you know what, I've made these choices in my career, mm -hmm. up to this point, um, where I really try to like question all the time, like, why am I doing this? Or like, what is it that I really want to do? Mm -hmm. And this was a piece I really, really wanted to do. It like paid um, honor to a lot of pianists that I love. Um, going back to Blind Tom mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Bruce Scott Joplin mm -hmm. and up to like Jason Moran. <laughs> uh -oh. but, um, <laughs> but yeah, just a range, you know, like of different generations, but kind of um, drawing from these different things and how we, yeah, the whole like bringing, bringing these voices together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like doing your work. Um, and so, um, anyway, it was just a piece I wanted to do, and I just remember in that moment giving myself permission to just enjoy myself. I think that was like one of my more free performances, and I was so nervous before, and then I just got up there and I was like, let's do it. Amen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can I ask you a question about that? Um, do you think that that breakthrough was situational, or do you think this was a permanent? Kind of, mm. kind of shift in your your mentality. Mm. I hope it's a breakthrough. <laughs> I want to have that. Like speaking of the no fear, like I want to have that more. But it's still. I mean, I guess every situation is different, and it, it really depends on the trust. Like I felt a lot of trust in that situation. Mm -hmm. Just you know, like being in that situation for a few days and and um, working with. I, it's just like you know, like sometimes with musicians, you're able to build up that trust, and mm -hmm. like I had that. Day. So I was able to, you know, just be free with it. The last time I felt free was uh, accompanying you well, at the piano yeah. with that beautiful, wonderful, rich, fully supported instrument that you possess. And the second I heard it, particularly the, the kind of profundity of your range, mm -hmm. I understood that if I participated in music making with you, that I would experience a certain level of freedom. So thank you for giving me that. And thank both of you for giving us this moment of freedom this evening. I think that's the perfect note to end on. I'm going to turn it back over to Someone when speaking of the great railroad investors, Mark Hopkins, once said that Mark Hopkins sitting on one end of a law and a pupil at the other end of the law automatically constituted a university. Because Hopkins was so brilliant and so well traveled. But if that's the case of Mark Hopkins and that pupil, those of us who were here, these incredibly brilliant scholars of music and of culture on one side and we on the other, 
We seated here in Mother Zion Church tonight are a full university system. Well, hey, hey. After the brilliance we have heard and heard perform very well this evening. Let's give them all a wonderful round of applause. Yeah. There you go. Wonderful, wonderful. As I close, which pre when preachers say that, we typically don't mean it, but we mean it <laughs> in this regard. Take a look up at the ceiling, if you don't mind. The architect for this building is a man named George Foster the second registered African-American architect in the state of New York. Church's name is Mother Zion. And he designed intentionally within this space the Negro spiritual. When you look up, this church appears to be the hull of a ship. Is designed is to be the old ship of Zion. Wow. So as you leave this place, as our foremothers and fathers have entered this building for the last hundred years, it being built upon this idea that there would be a ship that would land marginalized people in a place free from suffering and degradation. As you leave forth, considering liberation, Considering what it means to be free, go forth leaving that it is our job, be it in the classroom or on stage, to liberate the lost, to liberate the bound, and to bring light. And in this case, as is this evening, warmth into cold places. Amen. Go forth and have a wonderful evening.